Hello, everybody. Tommy Newberry here with you again for another edition of Achieving Optimal. Today, we have a very special episode. I call it a client spotlight, and I'm going to be chatting with uh, husband, father, entrepreneur, writer, Tom Green. Tom, great to have you with me here today. I'm ready to pick your brain. Are you ready? I'm ready, Tommy. Thanks for having me. Well, good. Well, let's let's um, set this up right. So we've been working together for four or five years. Um, we're about the same age, and uh, we know a lot of the same people. Um, kind of surprised that we didn't cross paths earlier. Agreed. But now it's kind of cool that I've learned more about you, and I've learned even more about you in preparation for uh, having this talk today. But I want to dig in with you about something that I'm fascinated with. I think you've had a, a, a great uh, level of success. I think you're a great success story. And I like to try to pull out the common elements of my clients and, really, and people I don't know, uh, what, what makes them tick and what uh, built the mindset that that contributed to their success because I know that you believe as I do that success is not an accident and that success blesses others, your success blesses others. So let's go back to your younger years, you know, when you were growing up, what kind of philosophy maybe came from parents, teachers, coaches, friends, what, what developed your mindset early on in life? So is this a therapy session or is this a podcast? Is well, this is an intervention, okay, actually. Okay, great. Yeah, there's, yeah, okay. Great. Well, uh, it's a good question. Um, you know, I, I think uh, if I look at what has fueled me um, back to an early age, I think it's a pretty simple answer, honestly, and it's fear of failure. And I think that's a great motivator in all men. If I look back on my, my childhood, if you really want to go into a therapy session, my parents got a divorce when I was really young. Yeah. And um, my mom went back to work, and I was the youngest of five kids. And so there was a certain amount of, of self-sustainability that had to be deployed. And, uh, and I don't mean that to be critical of my parents at all. I had great parents. I simply mean that, that my, my upbringing um, required a certain amount of scrappiness yeah. and self-sustainability yeah. that you know, I felt, at least to some degree, I had to look out for myself. Right, and you may not have been, that may not have been your first choice if you could wave a magic wand, true, right? True, true. But, but then it, it turned into something good for you. Yeah, it's turned into something great for me, and so I don't, I don't um, you know, I don't regret that, honestly, as much as I, it would have been interesting to have a different childhood. My childhood, childhood uh, fueled, to a large degree, my drive to be successful and my fear of failure because that self-sustainability, that, you know, reliability I had to have on myself became rocket fuel for my desire to work and perform and succeed. So what was up with the, um, with the fear of failure? Tell me about what that meant to you. And I mean, was that something you experienced when you went off to college or was it something you experienced when you were still in high school or what, what, w without it being a, a therapy session, what do you think caused that, that fear? Well, I think if you're walking on a tightrope and there's no net underneath you, um, your hands better be sweating, right? I mean, to a certain degree, not having... Yeah, do or die. Do or die. I mean, to a certain degree, not having that safety net underneath you, it tends to focus the mind a bit. And so from my standpoint, knowing that I didn't necessarily have much of a safety net behind me because I had parents who were, you know, taking care of their own lives, and to a large degree... Um, I, I was In other words, they own. weren't going to be supporting you, so if you were going to make it, Correct. it was going to be up to you. Yeah, and, and let me just say, I mean, I think I had parents who were tremendously emotionally supportive, but I mean, from a financial standpoint, it was pretty clear I needed to go out and make my own way, and there wasn't going to be some financial safety net below me if it didn't work out. Yeah. And that will cause your hands to sweat a little bit. It'll also focus the mind a great deal. Yeah, well, I think it's um, a great asset, actually. It is. Um, you can succeed uh, with a safety net, but when you don't have the safety net, uh, it forces you to that different level of focus and uh, maturity that you otherwise right. might not have or you might delay it just a little bit. Other, a similar kind of dynamic is, you know, when people move out of their hometown. Right. Um, and 
they have to kind of start over on their own, and that forces them to grow up, to build new relationships, to get out of that cocoon that they were accustomed to. Well, that's right. And so right after college, I, I, I moved out of town, um, and I joined a company who actively sought out to find young men who had a tremendous fear of failure. Interesting. They literally tested people to say, where, who are the kids coming out of college that are remotely successful already who, who have a tremendous fear of failure? And then how do we just throw gasoline on that fire to make them run and drive and perform for us? And they found me. I mean, I must have stuck out like a sore thumb. I mean, they grabbed me so quickly and, and channeled me in an interesting direction. So how soon was that after college? Two years. And what were you doing in the interim? Uh, I had worked for another company in the interim that was a uh, very similar company, but much, much more calm and measured. <laughs> and so you got into sales early. I did. Um, why did you do that? I love that, by the way. I recommend that to young people, virtually every young person. I mean, unless it's just not, you know, uh, connected to or um, in sync with their talent bank, I just believe that uh, learning to sell is a precursor to being an entrepreneur. Agreed. And it's also a character developer. And so when I see that, that somebody got into sales right after college, it makes me think, okay, they're they're getting prepared for greatness because really we all sell. So what, what drove you to sales? Well, I think it was a combination of, I, I felt like I had the ability to connect with people. And I also quickly figured out that my my compensation was directly tied to my effort and my performance. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, take that back and connect it to my childhood. All of a sudden now I'm in a position where um, I, I can kind of go the opposite direction. And then if I perform, I could have, you know, a wildly exponentially increasing rate of income. Right, right. And so I saw that and thought, hey, that's cool. That, you know, that sort of scratches that itch of, I didn't realize it at the time, but it scratches that itch of self-sustainability and, uh, and it's just incredibly motivating. You know, I think success motivates success. It sort of begets performance. Yeah. So and if you, if you didn't, you got into sales and that, you know, that was part of your plan, whether it was a deliberate plan or kind of an unconscious plan to make sure you avoided failure right. because you'd be in charge of your own destiny. Right. But then soon after you had success with that organization, you moved to another one, Right. I did. And, but that was a risk. So that's an interesting dynamic is you have fear of failure. You could have, you could have stayed there and played it safe, but you gave something up to go up, right? I did. And, and it, it's sort of my two worlds colliding. You know, it's a combination of having a tremendous fear, fear of failure that is motivating. And in the same sense, having a, a bit of anxiety that says, geez, if I do fail, um, it, it would be it would be cataclysmic, right? Yeah. yeah. So so kind of trying to skate on both sides, it, it it became a challenge, and so maybe to some degree I I took a step backwards because I wanted something a little bit more, um, a little less risky, but perhaps having a higher reward in the long run. And so I actually took a fifty percent pay cut and took a different job in the same industry as a way to sort of sharpen sharpen my skills. Was Were you driven by the potential that you could really elevate your income or was it a safer spot? It, it was honestly a bit of a safer spot, which is ironic. Having spent seven years at that point in a very, very high pressure, high, highly motivational performance-based environment, I sort of took a breather and a step back and a pay cut and learned a different side of the business that, that I thought would frankly serve me uh, well over the, a much longer horizon. I mean, to some degree, these, you know, highly motivational performance oriented sales positions. I mean, it's a young man's game, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you know, you can, well, only, it's also a relationship game. It's a relationship so then, game. You yeah. know, 20 years, fast forward 20 years in your career. And it's a, it's a pretty nice spot to be in right. if you've planted the right seeds early on. That's right. And I mean, I look back on, you know, normal Monday in that life, you know, I was in the office by 5 a.m., you know, 515 was like a rooster call. I mean, you needed to be there. And, you know, and I would work until 8, 10 o'clock at night. And that served me really well for a long time. And that, that in itself, it, it creates motivation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, you know, it sort of feeds on itself. But but there came a point where I thought, All right, okay, so how I can't old were you forever. at that point? 27. Okay, were you married? I had just gotten married. Just gotten married. Yeah. And so that's a great 
um, kind of transition point to talk about some of your habits of success as they played into getting your career up and going. So still pretty young. Yeah. Some people yeah. haven't even matured at all. Right. And so now you've gotten married and you're in your second or third uh, job or career and you're doing well. So you switch to this other company to learn to you're in the insurance industry. Right. And to learn to deal more directly with clients. Correct. Right. Yes. And so the income dropped a little bit, but there was a greater opportunity and it wasn't how long before you got back up on top. It's probably two years, maybe three at the most before I was back where I was in the prior role. Uh, but in a much happier, much more content, longer, you know, longer range plan where I knew I could do this part of this job. I knew I could do the other side of the job for a much longer horizon for as long as I wanted and probably have an exponentially, albeit, you know, more control, but an exponentially increasing income and value to the company. So do you recall, in addition to being an early riser, what other things you were doing that contributed to your success, particularly those things that you'd recommend for someone in a similar spot today? Yeah, I mean, if I look if I look back on it, it was uh, it was the obvious relationship building. It was making small deposits every day towards larger goals, and that's something I still practice today. But it's it's having some idea of of what the end game is, and I think that's really challenging when you're 27, 28 years old to try to look at the horizon and say, what am I aiming for? And it's easy now to look back on all that and say, oh, well, it looks very, it looks like a very organized, sequential approach that I took. And I think everybody's career, to some degree, looks looks logical in retrospect. But at the moment in time, I, I, I wasn't maybe as an intentional about what I was trying to do at that time. I just was trying to, I needed a job, then I wanted to make money, then I wanted to make more money, then I wanted a, more of a career, you know, and this stuff sort of all progressed and you're kind on of its looking own. at it on one phase at a time. Right, right. And it's, it's easy to look back on it and say, wow, he was really methodical in the way he went about that. Not, not really. Um, it's just sort of how it mapped out over time. And I'm not sure I was, I was intentional when I went through that exercise, but, but looking back on it, it's like, wow, that's so logical. You got married and you went into a different, a different line that was a little more stable that give you a longer term horizon. It looks like I was brilliant. I wasn't. Well, it is an interesting kind of progression. Right. And then, so you got back to where you wanted to be financially, at least for the time being. And then the impulse occurred to you, apparently, why don't I go out and start my own, my own thing? Right. Right. What, what was, how was that percolating in your mind or what, what gave you the, the confidence, if there was any, that you could pull that off? Well, I had a, a friend who I had worked with in the past who approached me and said, hey, you know, if we were to go into business together, we could, we could really do well, um, and I'd like to go into business with you. Well, having someone approach you and say, you and I are going to do this together versus you should go out on your own and start a business. Now, that's a totally different dynamic because now I've got a partner, and I've always enjoyed situations where I had a partner in something where you could at least share in the risk and the reward. And that was probably the first step. And then the second step was looking at how hard I was working at the time and how much I was billing. We were in a billable hour environment and the millions of dollars I was bringing into the firm. And I was making a fair income, but realizing they're keeping, you know, three fourths, if not more of. of yeah. The, so it was kind revenue. of a typical entrepreneurial impulse yeah. that I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I could be doing this on my own. Right or in a similar fashion, and then keeping more of the profits rather than being a worker. Right. And I, I've probably talked to 20 kids since then who've had that same aha moment. And I tell them all the same story of, you know, that's all great. You figured that out on your own. But listen, you know, there's a big difference between figuring that out on your own and pulling the ripcord. Yeah, it going is. Going out and hanging a shingle. You know, and I, I know a lot of people do not, um, Sometimes I think a, a trait that entrepreneurs have is is they do things before they're ready. Right. Um, in fact, I, I did a talk. I was actually the first time I did. I was in in Brazil, and of all places, and it was called "Start Before You're Ready." Start mm. before you're ready. It's a good and title. it doesn't mean before you're ready at all. Right. It, it you know that would be foolish, but it means before you're completely ready, because a lot of people wait to pursue their dreams <laughs> right. or to take the good risk um, until it's too late because they're trying to get everything ready. That's true. And so I've kind of been pondering this, and I'm thinking that really the quality is not that you're ready or that even that you're smarter, although you might be. It's it's that you're, you've made a commitment 
that you were going to go for it or you right. made a commitment, but you didn't have the confidence yet, but you you made the commitment. And I think something different with with entrepreneurs that I see all the time is they're willing to take that leap and then put the pressure on themselves. Right. So it was interesting how you kind of said the family dynamics and the fact that, you know, you had a good upbringing, um, uh, all things considered, but you were going to be on your own to make a name for yourself, to build your career and so forth. And that could look to some people like, well, that, that stinks, but it's actually an advantage. And so you said, you know, when there is no safety net, you know, when you're on the, on the tightrope, um, you've got to figure it out on your own. So that was kind of put in your lap, right? You it didn't was. have any choice for that. Correct. But then you go off and start your own business. Right. You're intentionally putting yourself into a, a position where it's sink or swim, right? Right. You could have played it safe. A lot of people do. The vast majority do. But something inside of you said, I'm going to figure this out. And, and I think you don't have to wait till you figure it out before you get started. That's kind of my long yeah. roundabout way of coming to it is entrepreneurs just start knowing they're committed to being successful. They don't know how. Right. But the lack of knowing how doesn't prevent them from getting into motion. Well, I, it, look, it, had my friend not approached me and said, I've got an idea. We could form a business together and we could print money. Um, I wasn't sitting around thinking, gee, I wish somebody would knock on my door and ask me to start a business with them. I mean, I was just clicking along, having a great career, and he sort of interrupted <laughs> interrupted my career yeah. and said, have you thought about this? And I, I really, you know, maybe some passing thoughts, but hadn't t- thought seriously about it. And then I started to think seriously about it, and he started to lay out the plan. Next thing you know, I'm in an executive suite, and uh, day one, you know, the phone's just blowing up. And I'm like, this is the greatest day ever. This is incredible. I should have done this a long time ago. Now, day two, about 8.30 in the morning, I'm sitting at my desk, and the phone's not ringing. And by about 11 o'clock in the morning, the phone had not rung one time. And I actually threw up in my trash can under my desk. As in thinking, oh, my gosh, I've made an I've awful made decision. I've made a tremendous error in judgment. This was the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. Okay, and then what happened? <laughs> and then I uh, – it's kind of funny. Wait, I, was that the bottom? <laughs> uh, yeah, it was close to the bottom. I, I, it was funny. I actually called my partner in, and I said, I just threw up in my trash can. And he said, well, why'd you do that? <laughs> you know, I said, I don't – I think we've made a mistake. I, we've, we're kidding ourselves. No one's going to hire us. And so we spent the better part of the day kind of hashing and rehashing why we had made this decision. And I'll tell you an interesting byproduct of that story is I said, listen – I've learned something about myself today. I can't sit here in this office by myself with the door closed and, and, and think about all this by myself. I would like to actually get rid of one of our offices, and I would like to have us move in together into one office because I get energy from you. I feed off of your energy. And if we could be in the same office together, I think we might be able to like channel this common energy we have between us, and it would be good for both of us. So we actually – from, from literally the first week we were in business, moved into an office together, and the entire time we were business partners, we shared an office with each other. Excellent. And people would come in and say, why don't you guys get separate offices? And, I, and we loved it because it just it allowed us to feed off of each other's energy. Yeah, well, it's very interesting because he's the one that was the catalyst for starting it in the first place. Correct. And then that added dynamic of, you know, people can – usually fall in one of two camps. They either are somebody that builds your energy or they suck the energy from you. Right. And, and that's easy for me to say, but it's, it's a reality that is not always easy to deal with because some of those people are family. You right. Know, some of them right. are good friends, right. but it's a law just like gravity it can be very inconvenient. And so I think that's a lesson that I would glean is getting around the right person. You know, you, you were, close enough to this individual that they thought of you right and they trusted you and they thought okay you could they could collaborate with you and that might be a good thing and then you kept the energy going you know by actually working together like right. physically together and what's funny um, it, it caused me to look at other entrepreneurs differently so I look at folks I'll take you as an example I look at folks who have started a business on their own and I have such tremendously more respect for them in going out and doing something totally on their own versus what I did. I had a, I had a partner and for me, just the way I'm wired, I just, it, it was very reassuring to know I had somebody in the fight with me 
that yeah. I had somebody I could call on the way home and go, I've had a horrible day and this is what happened and taught me off the ledge a bit versus, you know, when you're on your own, you're, you're having that conversation with yourself on the way home. You know, that <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, there's good and bad because golly, if I go back about 15 years, I must've had like a 10 year run where this was maybe late nineties, early to mid two thousands where, you know, I've got a lot of commercial real estate clients and, right. um, and that industry in particular is, uh, hot for partnerships and so forth. Sure. But it was like I had uh, at least two dozen clients that swore off partners, <laughs> you know. No so, kidding. Um, because you, that is, you're very, very fortunate. I know other situations where it's very, very fortunate, but, you know, it's, it's kind of like another marriage. It is. You know, and so you can pick really wrong, and then, you know, there's a big difference between starting up and hopes and dreams, and then all of a sudden you're either financially struggling or – you're financially um, prosperous, and right. either of those two scenarios can cause tension, and you know, make one or the other. So, uh, kind of uh, have problems that fester up. And the good thing with a partnership is, you know, you can, if you do it right, you figure out at the outset how you how you sever it or how you bring it to right. closure. Right. Um, and then that makes it a lot easier. But picking a business partner is very important, just like picking a spouse or in a larger sense, picking the people who you hang out with because people either motivate you to uh, take action, to be a doer, to get up at 5 a.m., to read, to use your discretionary time well, to focus on the long term, or they kind of shift you toward the other uh, approach, which is, hey, come on, just have fun. You can do that later. Oh, come on, don't be such a... Right. Uh, do good or or be so serious or that kind of thing. Well, it's res respecting each other's personalities as being independent and different and and symbiotic in a lot of ways. And so were you all um, complementary of very, one another? Yeah, I believe we Not were. redundant. Yeah, not redundant at all. I think we had very different skill sets. And it reminds me of an interesting part of the story, which is we formed our business. We were in business probably a month, and he came in on a Monday morning and said, I got a problem. And I said, what's that? And he said... Well, my wife was in my ear yesterday because we don't have any money in our checking account. And I said, well, d d I mean, did tiny you? Tiny little issue. Right, a tiny little issue. I mean, didn't you tell her that we're not going to get paid for a while? And he said, well, I think maybe I suggested that we'd have some money coming in pretty soon. <laughs> and we had no prospects of any money coming in anytime soon. And so we actually went out, both of us went out that day and wrote uh, checks from our home equity lines of credit. And we wrote those checks to ADP. And then we had ADP cut us paychecks back so that we could go home and hand our wives paychecks ah, <laughs> from ADP, nice. even though it was our own money. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> a little slide of hand a, there. A little, little trick, and, <laughs> yeah. and that settled things down. It did, and I have that check framed on my wall in my closet at home. Well, the, you know, that, as long as the story turns out well. The story turned out well. Uh, yeah. It could you know, I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you if the yes, story that, turned that, out that is true. Uh, the other option. So it went really well, kind of saying it turned out well as an understatement. So tell me how that came to conclusion and then uh, in a very positive way, selling the business and then right. transitioning to what you're still doing today. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the interesting thing about growing a business is uh, uh, you – when you're so in immersed in the business, sometimes it's hard to believe that someone else might find value in it. And unless you're actively out looking around for a buyer or talking to bankers, you know, to have someone call you out of the blue and say, we'd like to buy your business, you know, the first time it happened. And that's us, how it happened. That's how it happened. The phone rang and they, somebody on the other end said, we'd like to buy your business. And I said, I think you have the wrong number. <laughs> and, and they said, no, no, we've been following you. We know what you're doing. And, and we think you're, you would be very additive and complimentary to what we're doing, and we'd like to sit down and have a conversation. And so, sure, we'll have a conversation. So we sat down and had a conversation with absolutely no intent of selling and you our had business. no, you were not even interested not in thinking that Not remotely interested that in selling wild. our business. Not remotely interested. Frankly, didn't think it was worth anything, honestly. And then, uh, and then they, they, I'll never forget it, we were in a conference room, and they stood up and wrote a number on the whiteboard. And, and you, you know, that's a, they have to practice some self-control. Yeah, did to, you and your partner you know, like, not look at each other? Try not to make eye contact. <laughs> like, you know, they lost their minds. You know, how quickly can we accept this? 
And so uh, it, it was a it was a great firm and a, and wonderful people. And honestly, um, you know, in hindsight, probably a fair offer. We just didn't know what fair was at the time. And uh, we ended up accepting that offer through a course of some negotiations and and sold the firm. And then, what? How did your life change at that point? You know, it changed a bit because anytime you have, and an they wanted event, you to keep working. Oh, and yes. be a part of yeah. the the new entity. Right. I mean, I was pretty young at the time. I was, you know, 40 years old. So um, I didn't want to stop working by any stretch. And, and yet I had this equity event, this sort of windfall, um, which I I honestly worried, Tommy, that having a windfall might put out the fire that I had that had been driving me since I was seven years old. That all of a sudden now, when you talk about that safety net, well, wait a minute, now I've got the safety net. Am I going to continue to work as hard and be as motivated to get out of the bed on Monday morning as I have been when I had zero safety net? And were, were you? It's now been a little more than a decade, right? It's been a little more than a decade. And I think um, one of the magic things about money is, you know, it's never enough. <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> or, or how much money is enough? How much money is enough? Isn't it? Just a little bit more than more. you have. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's an unanswerable question. So it, no matter, I'm sure no matter what the number is, <clears throat> I don't know that you ever get to a point where you go, yeah, this is enough. I'm, you know, I'm good because you can, in your mind, create any kind of cataclysmic uh, outcome that could could change that dynamic. So, so it was nice. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it was a very nice. Okay, now I can really, really work hard because I'm not. I'm, I'm fighting a different game now, right? Yeah. So, what happened up here? What happened in your mindset when you have a an event like that? You sell your business. And you're young. Uh, what what are you thinking? How did your how did the fear that was previously driving you change? Or is that what you were talking about with like what would be driving you now? Right. Because you shouldn't that shouldn't fear, be afraid now. Yeah, you shouldn't be afraid right. now. So so what became the driver of your continued motivation and success? Or Eventually, what did it become? What are, and what is it now? Well, I think it's it's now what it was, uh, similar to what it was when that equity event happened, which is there's still a fear of failure. It's just a different fear of failure. I mean, nobody wants to fail. So now it might not be so much a financial thing. Now it's just a thing thing, right? <laughs> I just don't want to fail. I mean, from an optic standpoint, that desire to be successful, to be seen as successful – is incredibly motivating. And so... So that's not... That's a different animal, though, It's right? a different animal. That's a different animal. But it's, 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 in, you know, it's, it's in the same cloth, right? It's, it's still fear of failure. Um, it's now just more of an optical failure, but it's still a motiv- an incredibly motivating influence on what I do. So what else motivates you? I think everybody has a little bit of fear of failure, but there's also, you know, the... The, the fear of failure can can be a can be a bad thing or a good thing, sure. depending upon how you respond to it. But sometimes the fear of failure is really the fear of success at the next level. Right. Meaning, okay, I've mastered this level. Um, I'm not going to, uh, and I think you've broken through this barrier that I'm describing. But a, but a lot of folks succeed at a certain level, and then they don't get to the next level because they fear whether they have what it takes to operate in the major leagues. In other words, they've right. made it to AAA, and that's amazing. Yeah. But they kind of flounder there. Well, I mean, you tend to think it's a fluke, right? Yeah. I mean, you tend to think, Men wow, Men in that particular, was, that was for lucky. some reason, uh, constantly double, you know, check their right. their esteem of themselves. Like, right. I fooled, maybe I was I, just lucky. I, well, I fooled know? somebody once. I probably won't be able yeah. to fool them again. Yeah, right. and apparently one of the big things men are uh, scared of, kind of collectively, that 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 we found out is of being they're scared of being found out, well, right? You know, as a as a fraud or a huckster. Or, That's exactly right. And so they're keeping up that air the whole time, right? And you know, someone said to me right after our transaction, uh, "Man, you you guys were just so lucky," and that really bothered me. Yeah, it bothers me still today because <laughs> you know. Sure, there's a bit of, you know, luck and fortune and, you know, sure. Okay. I'll, well, there's I'll things that happen that can't be completely explained. Right. But often it's it's somewhat explained by the 
the number of repetitions, right? The showing up, right? You know, being in the right place at the right time, previous preparation, right? Um, and many other things. Well, I mean, look, we live in Atlanta, and I, I was, I was going to lunch meetings in Seattle. You know, I'd be on the phone with someone, and they'd say, "Well, let's get together for lunch sometime," and I would say, "How about tomorrow? I happen to be in Seattle," and I would get yeah. in my car and drive to the airport and get on a five-hour and twenty-minute flight to Seattle so that I could be there for lunch. I mean, that's the kind of things that we did. And so you look back on the saying, wow, you were really lucky to pick up all those clients. Well, yeah, lucky because I happened to be in Seattle tomorrow for lunch, right? Yes. Yeah. Had I not been in Seattle tomorrow for lunch, I wouldn't have been so lucky. You're very fortunate. There. Yeah, just it so, happened to turn so out So that's that creating way. your own luck. That's creating your own luck. I had a luck. similar story when I did an interview with Lou Dobbs. And uh, at the end of the interview, which was maybe 20 or 25 minutes on his radio show, when he used to have, it was like third or fourth largest radio show in the country, and he was in Manhattan. And he said, um, hey, if you're ever uh, back in New York, um, I'd love to have you on the show again. And I think that <laughs> <clears throat> that was the pleasantry. Yes. You know, that yeah, yeah. he He's probably tells nice. that to everybody. <laughs> yeah, right. So he goes, I'll give, you know, I'll... I'll look forward to seeing you sometime soon. And we shook hands and I left. And so about two weeks later, I emailed the producer and I said, hey, um, and I had my information down to kind of recoup his memory there. And I said, hey, uh, Lou mentioned uh, having me back on the show. And um, I happen to be in uh, in New York next week and also the week after that. (laughs) It's perfect. And so once we got a date locked in, <laughs> right. I made my reservations. Yeah. Well, to some degree, the producer's just happy to have a guest booked for next that week, is. right? A lot of people don't know that. Is, <laughs> yeah. is, uh, that's, I use that as my uh, advantage. They, a guest that they think won't make um, Lou look bad. Right. You know? Right. And it will show up at the appropriate time. It will time. show up at the appropriate time. So I did that one other time. That's great. So um, that was funny. And I think of that, put that in the category of creating your own luck. Um, and I do think, you know, growing up playing baseball and being obsessed with baseball, it was all, it was kind of like an aphorism or a cliche or somewhere in between that you'd always hear that, um, you know, Babe Ruth at the time and then Hank Aaron, you know, had such an enormous number of strikeouts, but they also hit the most home runs, you know, before the bonds and steroids came along. So it was, there's something interesting with failure and success and luck. In other words, luck, I, I believe some things happen, but it's more like chance. And, and you take more swings, you know, you have more meetings, you build more relationships, uh, you do the things that other people successful before you have done, such as getting up early, getting focused, hanging around the right people. All of a sudden, more good things tend to happen to you. And then other people call you lucky, but you know one of the drivers for them calling you lucky, one of the reasons they call us lucky is because it makes them feel better. Yeah. Well, if it's luck, yeah. I just happen to be unlucky. So. Right, right. right. I, haven't, I haven't had my yeah. turn of luck yet. It, it reminds me of this logic that's being floated around today in America, that the American dream is dead. Yeah. Um, and there's a, there's a follow-on to that, which I think is even more disturbing, which is that you know, entrepreneurs who've, rece- who've achieved a great deal of success – didn't earn that success. Absolutely. Right. So I, I started a business. I started a manufacturing business. I, I hired a thousand employees and I'm able to grow this business, you know, to a wildly profitable business. And then some private equity firm comes along and offers me a billion dollars for it. And there's a logic, there's a line of thinking out there today that says I didn't earn that money. Right. But that my employees earned that money or I earned the money on the backs of my employees. And I think that's so unfair to the entrepreneur that took the risk, that signed the personal guarantees, that took out the loans, that risked their home, and yeah, I mean, grew I, that business. I've spoken with so many entrepreneurs who have done ridiculous things, like um, you know, paying employees, you know, out of their personal checking account, right? Uh, uh, getting advances from their credit card, yeah. you know, to pay employees, and um, I've never yet run into uh, an entrepreneur who in any way, shape, form, or fashion, didn't put his team and the people, the employees, uh, ahead of their own financial success. Now, I know there's some some, uh, ridiculous kind of crony capitalism that goes on, but, you know, 70, I think it's about 70% of jobs in America, which are vital, not just to economic health, but economic health 
is underpins about everything else. Sure. But about 70% of jobs are created by small business owners, yep. you know, with companies that have uh, 200 and fewer uh, employees. Many of them have 10 or fewer employees in the small restaurants, you know, dry cleaners, uh, franchises and bakeries and, and the like. And that's the, the, the kind of the spine of America, but it's, it's an attitude. You know, that's what I think. Like right. when I see that it's, I think, you know, you can call it uh, collectivism, socialism, statism, whatever you want to call it, which all have some accurate uh, elements to it. But what it really is, is a, um, a misunderstanding based on a bad attitude. Right. And, and this isn't the first time that our country has faced these kinds of, of uh, m- mindset threats. It's something that uh, other countries have given into. Right. I, it, yeah, it's, it's so consistent with human nature. Yeah. For me to, the first thought is to think that things are unfair. Right. Okay. Then the second thing is when I know that things are unfair because I've been taught that growing up, and then I... I see you being successful. Right. That just kind of rubs it in my face, and now things look even more unfair. Yeah, well, you had a leg up, Yeah, right? yeah, and so you've got some kind of unfair advantage, and then, then when you hear the concept you know, of uh, equality and so forth misapplied, not speaking in terms of our creator or our legal system, but kind of saying, hey, you should have equal results. Right. You know, even though your your work ethic or your your ingenuity is not equal, you should have that. But anyway, it's kind of a, a toxic attitude soup, and that's why I think it's so important to focus on stories of success right. and learning the backgrounds of people who've been successful and realizing they became successful not at the expense of others, but in service to others. Yeah, you know? I, I think back on my brother-in-law, Jeff Smith, who started his own business. He had a, he had a very successful banking career, and mid-career, he decides, I'm going to open a manufacturing shop. And he goes out and he f- opens this manufacturing shop making spinal devices and grows, grows the business, you know, starts to kind of clip along and he needs to borrow some money. So he goes to J.P. Morgan and borrows $40 million. And I remember asking him, you know, how did you get J.P. Morgan to loan you $40 million? And he said, well, I had to sign my name as a personal guarantee. And I said, have you lost your mind? I mean, why would you sign your name on a $40 million personal guarantee of debt? And he said, well, what difference does it make? I don't have it. So they can't take it from me. I just thought that was – what a mind of an entrepreneur, right? Well, it's funny because, you know, in, in, in college or in business school, you'll learn about corporations. And, and one of the, the uh, reasons for a corporation is to be able to insulate yourself personally. Right. And then you get out in the real world and you find out that in most circumstances, uh, you can't, uh, you can't uh, get any kind of loan – Right. Without signing right. a personal, right. personal guarantee, guarantee. yes, <laughs> um, you get you could get you know a, a nominal loan yes. uh, that wouldn't uh, do the trick, and so you've got to sign a personal guarantee, and that's across many different industries. Yeah. And but the greatest thing about entrepreneurs is just they've just made a commitment that you know they're going to create their own value in the marketplace, right. Right. and they're not going to ask. You didn't ask for something from anybody no. until you had given something right. first, and it's just such a great thing. It's almost what we should. We, we try to raise our kids, maybe not specifically in economic manners, but it's it, pr- doing first. It's kind of like a modified golden rule, you know, give first before you uh, receive. Right. You know, and it because it's it's just powerful to focus on adding value to other people. You've done it directly and indirectly and now multiple industries, but adding values to, to other people in ways that are better than the competition um, so that other people's lives and businesses can be better. And when they are, you, in effect, get a commission. Right. But that wasn't guaranteed. No. And another thing that I think is really cool for entrepreneurs, and you seem to have avoided this, but you probably know a lot of, uh, have a lot of peers who are very successful, but they they crashed at some point. Right. You know, a business uh, went south. They lost everything and had to start all over again. Sure. And that's a very common dy- dynamic. But again, another positive quality of entrepreneurs is they're able to fail and still not be deterred. Right. And then come back using the wisdom of the failure to get to the next level. So that reminds me of the story of Elizabeth Holmes, who was the founder of Theranos, the one drop blood testing company that was. You know, started from nothing and rose to be worth billions and billions of dollars, and it was all a complete fraud. And she's essentially been indicted 
company's been shut down. People lost billions of dollars. And I saw an interview with her recently, and she's trying to make a run at it again. Yeah, <laughs> incredible. A complete fraudster. Um, but yet she believes in her own story so much. Maybe it's pathological, but that's to some degree the mind of an entrepreneur is, well, that was yesterday. I've forgotten about that. It's I'm going in a different direction. Now. I'm going to do it right this time. And, and it is interesting because um, that ability to kind of compartmentalize or just kind of put things aside and come back fresh, but – Back to the other kind of, you know, cultural uh, challenges that we're facing with people's views of the market and capitalism and so forth is, you know, something like that. The bad examples are disproportionately highlighted. Yes. You know, and there's bad examples everywhere, but the good examples are tremendous. I mean, basically, if you just followed any person around for their day to day activities, they'd be bumping into uh, entrepreneurial issues. ventures one right after the next is they just went about and did their their normal activities in fact you think of most of the household names these days you you trace back well who founded that right in many cases it's one person right in some cases it's two or three but i mean at one point we didn't have you know a dell computer you know and and their claim to fame was being these mail order computers at the time and you know the iphone didn't exist and then you, you, all these breakthroughs that we take for granted, Federal Express, things that didn't exist and then they did exist, and oftentimes the person who who implements them was not the first one who came up with the idea or the concept. They were the first one who said, I'm going to take action on this. Right. Well, if you look back on that story of Federal Express and Fred Smith, and he was in graduate school, and he wrote, wrote his paper. paper. Yeah. <laughs> he got a C on the paper because the instructor said – there's no way in the world this, this would ever work. work. So he gets a C on the paper, and then you know that was probably his fuel. Is I'm going to go out and prove you wrong. I'm going to prove you wrong, and he did. I mean, obviously, yeah. he did. Um, and that should have told a lot of people a lot of things. Yep. You know about yep. be careful where you take your advice. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, uh, by the way, you the the your brother in law got that company going the. Selling uh, parts or manufacturing spinal parts device. for spinal, spinal devices. Spinal devices. And then y'all were able to sell that. We were. You were an investor in that. And now you've turned that into helping other entrepreneurial ventures right. get up and going. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, so the story goes back to right after I sold my business. And uh, whether it just sparked something in my brother in law or maybe it was just fortuitous timing, he showed up on my doorstep at my office and said, I've got an idea for a business. And I said, Okay, great. You know, what is it? So he proceeds to draw it out on that same whiteboard where the number nice. had been written. And, uh, and I said, Well, that sounds great. You should do that. Well, he came back the next day. And he came back the next week and the week after that and the week after that. And finally, after about, I don't know, maybe two months of him coming to my office every afternoon around 3 o'clock and drawing the same picture on the whiteboard, I finally looked at him and said, you know, I love you to death. I mean, you're like a brother to me, but you got to get the hell out of my office. <laughs> and he's like, well, what, what, why? What's, what's going on? I thought, I thought you thought this was a good idea. I said, I think it's a great idea. I thought it was a great idea four months ago. And I've listened to you go through this spiel. Why haven't you taken action? Yeah. Why do you keep coming back here? Are you asking for my opinion? or my, my blessing. And he said, no, I just don't know if I can quit my job. And I looked at him and said, I want you to write down on a piece of paper how much you make a year. And I'm going to go get my checkbook and I'm going to come back in this room and I'm going to write you a check for that amount of money. And I want you to go home this weekend and tell your wife, my sister, that you're going to quit your job on Monday and start your business. And if you don't do that, you can tear up the check, but don't ever come back to my office again to talk about this. I love it. I love it. The gauntlet, <laughs> the gauntlet. was thrown down. <laughs> it was really funny. And I didn't do it in an unkind way. I did it in an you know, incredibly supportive way. But to say, look, let's do it or let's don't do it at this point, I don't care. But you clearly have a passion for this, and you need a spark. So here's the check. Go get it done. So I wrote the first check on, on the way in. Um, and then the rest of the story. And then the rest of the story is eight years later, we sold it to a private equity firm for $165 million. So it, and, and now you've used those funds right. to get involved in a wide variety. Touch on a couple of those. Yeah, I think so those are just fun and inspirational. They are fun. Some work, some yeah, not work. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you about the ones that worked. Um, so <laughs> Focus on the positive. Yeah, all, all in and around healthcare and um, healthcare related products and um, we're investing in exosomes, which is a biologic component that's supposed to have in- incredible results. Yeah, we results. were talking about that the other day. Yeah, it's yeah. just amazing results with skin care and hair growth. 
Um, we've invested in a, a, a shoulder screw company for rotator cuff surgery that is cutting edge. Um, we've invested in several biologics companies around medical procedures. Excellent. And look, all those haven't worked out great. Um, some better than others. Many um, still in process. Yeah, many. Yeah, many still in, in process. And you know, and we're always looking for new opportunities to invest and to help. Typically, um, folks who have some kind of an IP some kind of a, you know, a novel approach to something in healthcare, but maybe they're an academic and they're not exactly sure where to go with it. And we sort of come in and create uh, the business the, side of yeah, it. Yeah, inject and... the capital and try to help them build operations and, and execute because a lot of these people are academics and they have no idea what to do with their product. So how, how deeply involved do you get in those things? You know, I don't, I, I, I play a role of an investor. You know, I still have a, a day job that's incredibly demanding. And, um, and so I, I devote full time to so that. So you just kind of coordinate some resources, uh, plug people together, and yeah, um, stand in the background. I'm more of a connector. Um, I like to connect people. Um, I don't. I don't actually like to get my hands dirty. So, <laughs> so I get my hands dirty in my day job, and I really love connecting people. So I'll find somebody with an idea, and I'll connect them with somebody else with capital or with connections or operations, and and then I'll step out. Um, and and that just is incredibly motivating and energizing to me. Well, that's a that's a cool story and a cool way to allow your success to bless others. Right. Because in addition to your services, like the insurance services, and then in addition to the uh, spinal parts, you know, for that were used, I guess, used in surgery and all right. sorts of things. That's a blessing. But then you 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 did so well with that, and and your brother-in-law that you were able to sell it, and then as a result, your success from something else is now allowing other businesses to get up and going. You're blessing some of these people that have an idea but don't know how to execute it. That's right. And it just goes on and on. If we, right. yeah, I don't know how big that whiteboard was, but we could not draw out the the you know the diagram of how many different branches that success. Uh, flows to from one single entrepreneurial venture. You know, th then you can trace point. it back all the way to some of your initial uh, inclinations right after college or while you were still in college. That's right. Um, I, I think about that sometimes of how many people that these investments and ventures have been able to employy. Um, and it, it's, it's, you have any idea? Do you, have you ever come up with a number? Um, it's, you know, what's a shallow number? Of 500 probably. I mean, I mean that's just ballpark. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that you could be ballpark. connected to yeah. something like that. And it's probably more, yeah. it's probably more, probably is. but then let's say what you're, you're able to save, um, you know, big companies money on their insurance, yeah. which is then going to allow them to hire, hire more, more people. people. And then, so right. indirectly that number has got to have maybe another zero on it. It does. Yeah, I'm sure it does. I mean, that's one of the, my blessings, I think, is that um, along the way of helping fund a lot of these startup companies, you know, I still love my day job and I have a group of 10 partners who I just think the world of. And so, you know, I'm working every day for, for those partners um, to try to raise the boat in, in my in my day to day business. And so a lot of these um, other investments that I make and board seats that I sit on you know, that's those are things that are done at night and on weekends. So, um, so you're 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 managing clients. You're generating new business. Right. That's your main thing that you're doing. Yeah, and I'm st I still have a passion for that. So it's not that. Yeah, you know, and I think that's a, maybe an interesting point for people who are listening is that you know sometimes you can do two things at once. And I think I've been able to to do that for a, a long period of time. So you know, invest quality quality time in my my day job, uh, which I love. And also have a passion for starting small businesses and funding those businesses, you know, almost out of my basement. Yeah. Well, I think it's a lot easier to do once you have been seasoned a little bit. Right. And you're kind of fluent, you know, in, yeah. in how to do the main thing because you've been doing it so long that you can create greater value in a shorter period of time, which then allows you some RAM to go do a few other things uh, in the free time. But I wish we had more time, but before we're... We, we wrap up, I've got to ask you about something else that you do in your free time, which is, <laughs> this is, uh, I guess, on Saturday evening. You, the other things are on Friday evening and then after church on Sunday. Yes. You, so um, writing has really, you've become uh, 
you're just so lucky as a writer. I'm lucky. I'm very lucky as a writer to find the right words. Right. You're, well, you're well just said. so lucky to have yeah. so many followers. And um, this time last year, um, I did not know. I knew you, but I didn't know that you wrote. And I had heard, seen little bits and pieces of of uh, kind of murmurings that you were writing, but I'd never seen the byproduct of it until just in the last six months. So tell me about your blog, which is um, which people can track down at TomGreen.com, Tom Green with an E, TomGreen.com, and also a podcast, a recent podcast, The Tom Green Show. What, yeah. what, what inspired all that? Because it's really fascinating. It's like, to me... Um, it's kind of unexpected, but it, but it's interesting. That's why I wanted to talk to you in more depth. Yeah, it sort of conflicts with everything we've been talking about for the past 40 minutes or so. I mean, it, I don't make any money off of my blog, and I don't have any intention of ever making any money. But it seems like it's some expression that is important to you. It, it is. I, you know, I feel, like, I feel like I have something to say, um, and I feel like I have something to say on a subject that is totally unrelated in many ways to what we're talking about here in this podcast. And a lot of it uh, sparks from my general impression that I think there are a lot of men out there that are struggling. And I mean, I don't mean struggling financially. I don't mean struggling as entrepreneurs. I mean, just struggling from a mental health standpoint, from an anxiety and depression standpoint. And, um, you know, it's not a very exciting topic to say, hey, I write about depression and anxiety. I mean, no one's ever going to read your blog, right? Um, But I try to write about those things from a different perspective, try to make them a little bit lighter. And look, my mission's really simple. I'm trying, I'm trying to make the point to men that there are options out there, that there is therapy out there, that there's a faith life out there, that there are people who care. Because a lot of this is inspired by some uh, suicides of some folks. Right. You know, and they weren't my best friends, um, but they were acquaintances of mine that I felt like in retrospect, um, that their suicides, their deaths were senseless, um, that they didn't, they didn't need to do that, number one. And number two, I'm not so sure they left anybody with real perspective on what they were dealing with, right? I mean, when someone commits suicide, the first question you ask is, what well, happened? Yeah. What happened? And we never get an answer to that. So we ask it over and over, what happened? Well, what happened anyway? You know, and no one ever gives you the answer to say, oh, well, here's what. So in the absence of having that answer to that question, people assume, well, he must have had a girlfriend. Well, it must have been financial troubles. Was he on drugs? You know, they go in these directions that are so unfair to the person who, who was suffering. And a lot of times I think the answer is just simple. They were suffering from garden variety, anxiety, and depression. And as men, they just didn't know what to do with that. So, I, you know, when I read some of your posts, you get a lot more out of it than just understanding the importance of mental health. You know, you kind of, you kind of, you, you take it from a different perspective where it can, that's important, but you don't necessarily know that that's the main, I mean, other than a couple, that that's the main thing that you're focused on. Well, because, you know, back to the beginning of my podcast and my blog, I really strongly felt that if I created a blog and a podcast about mental health um, or about faith, that there are other folks out there that could do that a whole lot you know, a whole lot more successfully than I can. And and you've heard me say many times, I'm not a pastor or a therapist. I'm just the dad down the street trying to make sense of some of this stuff. And and that's really the truth. So I'm, I'm writing stories that I think are inspirational as much as they are informational. And so if one gets you to the other, I'm fine with that. Yeah, I think that's great. I want you to be entertained by my Obviously, view. the other uh, sources weren't um, doing a great job. You know, right. no offense to them, but, right. you know, I mean, obviously there's a great problem going on and it's not getting addressed. So, you know, how do you be a part of the solution? And you said, well, I can, I can try to make a difference in this way. I can try. And I, and I look, I'm not trying to change the world. I'm not trying to boil the ocean. I'm trying to reach the one guy that's out there that says, Hey, um, I don't, I don't really know what to do with this that I'm struggling with. Do you have any ideas? That's all I want. That's all I want. You know, send me a text message and I'll hook you up with some people. Well, it was kind of fascinating working with you on your goals of, of how you came to this process with drafting so many in advance. Right. Uh, tell us about that. Well, um, I give you Cause much I thought, of the credit for this, honestly, and not, not just because uh, I'm on your podcast, but I, but I honestly do. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I really felt like— Well, that's why I asked you about it. Yeah, well, that was perfect, perfectly teed up then. Um, 
I, I really, uh, you know, I've had good business success and I have great family and, you know, life's, life's good, but I've always sort of felt this nagging desire to do something, to do something. Like there's something left undone. It reminds me of this great Walt Whitman quote of most, len- most men lead quiet lives of desperation only to die with their song still in them. Mm. And like you can, you can, you can read Painful. that quote. Yeah. You can read that quote two ways and you can read it and say, Oh my God, that's so sad. You know, and then you can read it another way and say, well, gosh, I don't want to die with my song still in me. Yeah. Great opportunity there. Great opportunity. So for me, it's always been, okay, well, have I found the song yet? You know, is it, um, have I found it? And so you were incredibly helpful in helping me kind of identify my, my talents and my gifts, my spiritual gifts. And I remember a conversation with you when you said, <clears throat> well, what do you like to do? And I said, I like to write. And you said, well, then why don't you write? And I said, well, I don't know what I'd write about. <laughs> and you said, well, why don't you sit down and write something and see what comes out? And honestly, I did. And, you know, 38 blog posts later, I said, hey, Tommy, I, I think I got something here. Well, that's what, what stood out to me the most was not even the content or the purpose behind it, but was your method. Um, which, correct me if I'm wrong, but was to, you kind of had a rule with yourself or a game with yourself. I'm going to write, did. I'm going to draft X number of these, right? and then I'll start posting. Right. Right? Right. That's exactly right. Because How did um, that work? Because well, I, 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 when I see how much you've written and, and the quality of it, and I'm a writer, I, I kind of look at it and think, I understand uh, what that takes to yeah. put something together like that. Well, I, I, and I don't want to put anything out there that isn't absolutely the highest quality I can release. I mean, I really, I, I, I can't say that strongly enough. But what I was more fearful of is is writing a couple of blogs and putting them out there and making the statement that, you know, I'm the guy on the subject and read my stuff. And then all of a sudden, magically, you know, the last post is like November of 18. You yeah. know, I, I just, I wasn't <clears throat> willing to take that risk. So I, I also didn't want to create another stressor in my life. So what I did is I made a goal with myself that I would write a year's worth of material um, before I would, would allow myself to post the first one. Yeah, that's outstanding. And it, it was it was great because what I didn't want is to post one and get all the accolades of wow you're a great writer and this is so 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 fantastic and then you know write two more and lose interest. So, I but thought, you gained a lot of traction. I have, with that. yeah, and, yeah, and have. you've been prepared with the next one and the next one and the next yeah. one because they were largely done ahead of time. Maybe you had to edit them or polish them or something like that. But yeah, I, it's funny. Somebody said, "What are you writing about now?" And I said, "Well, I have I have thirty stories." Um, that haven't been released yet. So, um, wow. Yeah, See, I'm, I'm jealous yeah. right now. <laughs> right. So I like I don't I don't know what next week's post is going to. I, I do know because I figured it out this morning. But for the most part, you know, but you, it's already the written. week after next, you may not. Know. I, I don't. I mean, it's already written. But like, I'm going to put I'm going to put my you know the spin on it for this particular week that we're in that might be might not have existed you know four months ago when I wrote that piece. Well, I think that's awesome, and I also think it's powerful to just do something. I think there's a big. Yeah message that regardless of what's driving you, if you've got an impulse to do something, just do it. And, um, you know, we were going to talk about some more things, etch memories. Um, uh, give me, get, we, I'm going to just make this longer. Uh, and give me an etch memory that you've uh, executed. An etch memory is a wild, atypical, fun experience that you usually share with others that you remember forever. And that's kind of how we define it uh, in the 1% Club. How do you how, how have you used that? Because, you know, quarter after quarter you come in with, um, and sometimes you send me an email ahead of time that says, you know, you need to expand <laughs> the space that you give me because right. I'm bringing in a lot of pictures yeah. and mementos, uh, which inspires me. But what are some of the fun uh, experiences that you've deliberately created that have stuck with you or that have been meaningful enough that you brought something in and said, hey, here's here's one of uh, my trips or one of my family outings. You know, the first time we met, you, I said, how do you, how does this work? What are you going to do for me? Because I think I have my life pretty well figured out and I don't think you can help me. And you said, what are your five biggest goals in life? And I said, I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I've never thought about that. And he said, well, then I don't think you have your, your life completely mapped out. And <laughs> That's funny because like, I, have, I have no memory of that, <laughs> yeah. but I'm, I'm uh, glad that I, yeah, was, I had that retort it uh, a, ready. It was, a, you know, it was a fun back and forth. And, um, and you've accomplished a heck of a lot of goals yeah. in the last three or four years. But Well, so you, you gave the example of set your five biggest lifetime goals yeah, and work yeah. your way backwards, right? And so um, one of those was to create 10 etched memories with my family, with my wife and daughter. And so... 
um, along that same time, I came across this company called Backroads that does bicycle trips around the world, and not around the world, but across the world. Yeah. And uh, and so I set a goal that we were going to do as a family ten of those trips to ten of the most amazing places on the planet. And so. And where are you now? We're number eight. List? We're at number oh, eight. Man, that is yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. So we have two two to go. So one's booked, and one you is tell anybody's a, guess. List a couple of the places uh, that you've been. The Netherlands, uh, the beaches in Normandy, to tour through uh, Omaha Beach on bicycles. Um, Southern France, uh, Italy, Tuscany. Yeah, I've seen um, some of the pictures are just amazing. Yeah, really. Can't I? I, I, I I'm not compensated by Backroads, the company, but but I should be because I, honestly, I think they're one of the finest. What's the next one on the horizon? I would like to be able to say I have 15 close personal friendships. Now, where'd you come up with 15? It it just. I started out at 20, and then I went back to 10, and 15 seemed like the right number. And at some point, you know, how many friendships can you really manage? And I don't mean acquaintances. I mean, you know, true friendships. And um, and I think that's really challenging for men, particularly when we're, you know, middle age, and you've got, you know, you've got work, and you've got church, and you've got family and sports, and, you know. Only got, so much time. There's yeah. only so much time in the day. And unfortunately, I think as men, you know, friendships tend to be something that we – um, you know, is sort of the lowest rung on the ladder of of the needs. Yeah, um, it's probably one of the highest needs, but in terms of of the easiest one to 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 basically shirk. Yeah, um, I hear it over and over again. I mean, just because there's there's only so much time, and you're interacting all day long, and you know, then there's you know what what gets cut out at home while I'm pursuing right. you know time with friends, yeah. and so. You know, it's tough to get done, particularly in certain phases of life. Yeah, agreed. Um, but I think it helps to kind of look at your life in, in slices or seasons, in which case you can address the deficiencies from one season in the upcoming season rather than just think, well, you know, that's how it was. That's how it has to be. You can transition to the next season and go, well, you know what, in the next season, maybe it's a decade, maybe it's the next 15 years, in the next 15 years, I'm going to emphasize this. Right. Just like in the early, you know, in a previous season, you may have emphasized something completely different. I think that's okay because some people are capable of, of m- managing multiple things right. at a high level. Right. And some, they just water down everything when they do it. And so um, hopefully that's helpful to folks to, to think about an option of looking at your life kind of in a series of sequences, phases, or seasons, right. so that when you're 80, you can look back and go, okay, overall, I lived a balanced life. But yeah, if I mean, you saw I, me I, in, it, right. in, in <laughs> March of 2020, maybe not so much. Well, and I, I do think uh, the beauty of those lifetime goals is they're lifetime goals, right? I mean, they're, I may never check that one off. I mean, it's just a constant daily reminder, yeah. I need to be investing in my friendships. And I just read a story on my blog site, uh, and, and this may just sound terrible, the five, five fears of the dying. Oh, yes. And it um, does sound terrible. It You're does correct. sound terrible. It's actually very motivating. <laughs> it's uplifting. Um, and, and number four was, um, they wish they had invested more time in their friendships. Yeah. Yeah. Because when you're on your deathbed, you can't call somebody and say, Hey, I'd love to rekindle that friendship. I mean, you know, you've only got so much time left. Yeah. Well, when, when, when you realize, or, you know, I think the only way somebody gets a real sense for how they use their time is to track it. Right. And so, you know, there's there's these great trackers for your diet and nutrition and all that that really, you know, are eye-opening. And I think some people lie to themselves about how they use their time and, and squander it, and that's all we really have. I mean, that's, that's the most important thing that you can be a good steward of, really. You know, people think of stewardship and they think of money, you know, and talent. Those are important, very important. But time... That's something that we're all given equal amounts of. Right. So in my mind, that's the most important um, thing to be a good steward of. And I think you've been a great steward of it. Well, if I, if I think back of what, what you guys have taught me, um, it's about making you know, intentional small deposits every day towards your goals. Absolutely. And so, I mean, and, and I'm in very, very intentional as a result of that. And so one of the, one of the things I do every day is I make, I make sure that I uh, – every day call a friend i mean i might not get them on the phone i might get a voicemail and that's okay yeah well i'm looking at your um at your tracker for the day and um you know you've got a great a lot of great things on there and there i see it right there call a friend um 
you've got texting your wife and daughter, mental nutrition, handwritten note, scripture verse, you know, read at night, read the portable coach, our planning tool, have fun. I mean, those are, those are great things. And, um, it's so easy. Will Rogers once said, it's so easy to forget what we already know. Yeah. And so if we don't have a system for making sure that we stick to our priorities, then the laws of human nature take over and we tend to drift from them. Yeah, it's very easy. You know, and, and especially today's day and age, I mean, you can blow a lot of time, you know, on, on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and, you know, all the social media sites, which, you know, look, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those, but if you spend your time doing that. It's okay that, if you want to. Though. Yeah, yeah, I mean, look, it's fine. Um, but it, it, everything in, in moderation. Um, but, I, but I do think there are intentional things you can do every day in exchange for the time you're contributing towards those sort of useless activities that really reap rewards, like calling a friend and texting your wife and reading scripture. And Yeah, some things you'll just skip if you don't think of it. Sure. It's easy. All right. Well, this has been great. I wish we had a little more time. There were some other things on my list that I wanted to get to, but we'll pull it to a close there, and maybe we'll come back and do a part two at some point great. in the future. I'd love to. Thank you for uh, investing this time with us. Your success has blessed many others. Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you.